Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Wanda Seeger. Well, thanks, Jennifer. And uh, thanks to all of you. Thanks for making the time to be here tonight, and welcome. Can you guys hear me OK? Yes. yes. All right, excellent. Wow, so, so let me get started with uh, kind of a little reminisce over last year. We have had the great fortune to tell the stories of Apollo over the last year. So just to show a hands, how many folks have had the opportunity to hear a bit more about Apollo missions and learn a bit more? And really, it's everybody, right? It was everywhere. Um, and I personally found it to be amazingly rewarding. There were stories of um, the astronauts, um, the history and uh, accomplishments. And what really surprised me was some of the high resolution photography. It was completely mind blowing. But what I found immensely satisfying were some of the extra interviews that were, were done. I had the opportunity to spend some time listening to the stories of some of the Apollo engineers, and some of the Saturn V engineers as they talked about their challenges. And, and I realized that the questions that were asked of very young engineers were unbelievably difficult. And, and, and uh, I, I, was, <laughs> I was given the opportunity to actually sit down in rooms and just have folks share and tell me some of the things they accomplished. And they showed up with their treasure boxes. And I don't know how many, many of you are engineers from back in the day, but you'll recognize that one of the most significant things that you have is that bottom drawer where you've got the bits and pieces of the hardware that you built and some of the things you've tested that no one's ever done before. And I heard stories of... Uh, welding. I heard stories of finding ways to develop handholds for EVA operations on lunar missions. And I realized that it, it wasn't just one big series of accomplishments. There were millions of tiny miracles that happened to pull these uh, fantastic missions together. And I remember one day I was, I was listening to, to a retired engineer who told the story of the solutions that he'd made for EVA after the Apollo 1 fire. And as I looked into his eyes, I realized that, that we've been standing on the shoulders of giants. These, these folks built a foundation and level of capability that has moved the world. Um, so when we talk about the last 50 years, it's not just Apollo. It's all the things that were enabled. It's um, the fact that we had Saturn Vs that were capable of launching Skylab, our first space station. Um, it led into the designs for space shuttles, which we flew for 30 years and built an international space station. We have had a continuous presence in space for almost 20 years now. And the observatories, so the, the, the discoveries, the kinds of things that we've learned about the universe have been absolutely phenomenal. And oh, by the way, we're talking about something else. There are $360 billion in a global space economy, dozens of countries are participating and it's growing every year. The recent investments, involvement of uh, private investors over the last few years have changed our dialogue. We're talking about space in terms that we never even considered before. So what's next? We're definitely going to have the opportunity to build on the accomplishments of the past, right? So, so we have a vision that's been laid out for us by NASA, which says that, you know, it's not just a matter of going back to the moon. It's a matter of building a sustainable capability. So, so there's a focus on logistics. There, there is a plan for a small spacecraft that will be in orbit around the moon that will serve as almost an office for astronauts and scientists who will take a five-day mission up. 
they'll work. They'll do sorties back to the lunar surface. They'll get smart. They'll develop a level of capability and knowledge that we'd never gained before, particularly through persistent engagement and surveillance. This, this spacecraft is going to grow to an even larger spacecraft, which will allow us to understand ways to operate um, and go to Mars, a bigger vision. And we will practice. Um, we will send astronauts back and forth. And after 10 years or so, NASA's going to Mars. <laughs> what do we have? That's our challenge, right? Our challenge is what do we do with what's been built? What do we do with that sustained capability? Are we really going to leave it to the scientists? Are we, you know, obviously, after, after NASA's uh, vision takes them to, uh, to Mars and, and missions take them to Mars, there will be lots of lunar science. There, there will be international partners. And hopefully, ESA will have built their moon village. Um, but what are we going to do? What are we going to do? That, that, I think, is the challenge. What are we going to do? Are we going to take? The challenge of building our larger, multi-billion dollar lunar economy, are we going to make this mission not just about the really smart guys and the astronauts that are going to the moon, but are we going to make this about something that we, as taxpayers, want to live and work on, to own, to make part of our new space journey? Potentially, there's a place on the moon where not only can we get smarter and we can do things on the moon, but we can also have a community. Remember, this will be generational, right? We have a potential for having folks look back at Earth and see the world as a very different place, perhaps a place that values diversity of thought and of culture because they see that precious little blue orb in space all along. So is it worth it? I, I think so, absolutely. I think that anything that's really, really hard will drive solutions and answers that will change the world. And it will be over a sustained period that will make us smarter and better people. And oh, by the way, there is an interest in space that is growing, that's unprecedented. The, the um, folks at, at Kennedy Space Center have done a poll, and, and they asked folks, with your renewed interest in taking a visit, what are you most interested in, the stories of the past or the stories of the future? And the answer came back that 26% are interested in stories of the past. 74% want to know what the future is. They want to know what new discovery is out there and what it's going to take and how they're going to be part of it. Some of the stories that you hear when people talk about lunar exploration certainly include the science objectives and goals. But there's always that little tint of a story at the end where they say, and oh, by the way, there's going to be tourism. Folks are interested not in the new discovery, but they're interested in the role that they're going to play. So can we do it? Yep. How do I know? Apollo. <laughs> so how do we pull it off? That is the big question. So first, I'm going to start with what I'll call bad math. Every number that you see on this slide is wrong. But amazingly, the results are logical and compelling. <laughs> so, so this is a build slide. I'm going to start with my understanding of what I think the lunar campaign looks like. Um, so we'll start at the bottom, I guess. There are a series of contracts that have been let for commercial lunar landing and launch services. There is an engagement of the private sector in providing launches at a regular cadence with a number of potential uh, companies that are going to be involved in that effort. All of those launches are going to be uh, done with commercial launch vehicles. Um, we have uh, a series of planned tests for the Orion and space, space launch system, which are ongoing. Some of them. We'll start out as uncrewed, and then they'll be crewed, and we'll be developing that capability overall. Meanwhile, there's some larger components of this space ship, uh, the mini gateway that are being built. Those will also be launched in commercial launch, uh, uh, sort of with commercial launch services. Um, all of those things will uh, come together 
in 2024, where we will have an automated assembly of a mini gateway. We'll have some capability on the surface. If there will be a crewed mission to the gateway and a surface landing. Um, the next five years after that, we'll see a series of additional tests on the lunar surface with um, development of a more durable logistics uh, module or capability or habitat at the surface. Um, and then we will proceed with the longer term science activities. How much will it cost? So, uh, as most of you may know, NASA has not uh, been able to develop uh, and has not uh, presented the cost of the program. They expect that they'll be out in 2020. So I've made a few uh, general assumptions that, that I'll share, um, and I'll call them play costs. So I've broken up the cost into what I'll call three categories. Uh, development costs, uh, costs to develop a durable habitat, and the cost of habitat maintenance. Uh, the assumptions I made for the dollars are that the development would take the existing uh, exploration systems development ESD budget that NASA has and multiply times two and carry that for 10 years. And, and the reason I came up with that was because of an answer to a question that Bill Gerstenmeier gave to the National Academy's um, AS ASCB uh, earlier in the year. Uh, he was asked, what's it cost to take a program that had been planned from 2020 to 2028 and squeeze it into 2024? And he, his answer was, it's going to cost the same. So it's roughly double the cost in order for us to do the exact same scope. So we're going to need double the budget in order to pull this off. So I stuck with that as a two times number. Um, durable habitat. Um, my assumptions for that were that we take the non-recurring costs for the International Space Station minus the space shuttle costs. Uh, the IG developed a cost for about $43 billion for that scope, and I multiplied it times three. Um, because space station was designed to handle seven uh, uh, personnel, uh, the smallest permanent station on Antarctica is about 20, so I said well, 20 heads or so seems reasonable. I'll multiply it times three. Um, and then habitat maintenance is the ongoing budget that NASA has for space station, again, times three. Magic numbers. And then I laid it out uh, as expenditures, negative cost, which you see on the bottom, bottom row. So I'll just I throw out a few benchmarks. So, so that math magic uh, comes to a maximum of about $20 billion a year and the most uh, busy uh, phases. Uh, compare that to the data that's come out for how much it costs for a single Apollo lunar uh, landing. It's about $23 billion per, per landing. Within a year of this protected campaign, we'll see um, per year one crewed mission of the Orion SLS per year and about five commercial launch service missions in there. Oh, 20, 23. Uh, billion dollars. Um, uh, the habitat comes in about $130 billion. Uh, the benchmark I'll throw out is the 2019 year costs of the Russian planned permanent station, which they had developed uh, almost 50 years ago, uh, Zvezda, uh, which they estimated to be $123 billion. So 123 versus 130, again. All the numbers are wrong, but the conclusions, I think, will bear uh, examination. So a J-curve, really? So, so for those of you that may have guessed, yes, the little voices in my head are making their own slides. But so, so what's a J-curve? Uh, so the J-curve is a tool that's typically used in business in order to assess returns on investment and establish break-even points. Um, and the methodology is simple. Uh, costs are negative amounts, revenues are positive, and you net those out and put those on an x-axis, which is time. And the intent is to look to see how long it takes for an investment to eventually make money, right? So you're looking at that time window to see how long your money is going to take to turn around, if it's going to turn around. And then if you've got all the data on here accurately, you can perhaps get a feel for what your return on investment might be. 
Why? Why would I possibly use a tool like this in order to tell this story? And the answer is framing, right? There's a, um, there's a professor at Stanford, uh, Dr. Selig, who teaches a class on innovation. And one of the things that she teaches is that the answer to your question is often embedded in how you've asked the question. And the example she gives is a simple one, which says, I know it's uh, Jennifer's birthday, and I ask, how are we going to plan for Jennifer's birthday party? Well, the assumption there is that Jennifer's actually going to have a birthday party. If instead I'd ask the question, how are we going to make Jennifer's birthday memorable, I get a whole other range of potential solutions, right? So by introducing a concept of return on investment, the intention here is for us to change the question. So instead of asking, what are we going to do for a lunar campaign, if the question instead is, how is the investment that we make in a sustained lunar campaign going to provide a return, I might get different solutions, right? And remember, for discretionary funds, everything is competed. So, so dollars for space to understand uh, the moon are competing with other science dollar uh, objectives and goals. They're competing with social causes. They're competing with a wall. Uh, so, so there's got to be some consideration of how we establish a sustained and uh, positive story. Let's talk about lunar revenue. So if that's a focus, lunar revenue, what are some of the things that might be pertinent? There were $3.2 billion in investment in 2018 in startup companies. That's up from $2.5 billion in 2017. There is an interest in startup space because the innovation, the technology, associated with both business models as well as execution are providing phenomenal returns. Things are being implemented faster, and, the, there, and there is a, a real benefit in putting a dollar in a startup space company as opposed to other investments. There's zero private sector customers. The customer for lunar space, deep space, is the government. This is going to take a while. It's going to be at least a 10 to 20 year campaign, no matter how you cut it. It's a lot longer than an administration. It's longer than congressional cycles. If we want to maintain a consistent focus, there's got to be more than a vision for what we're going to do. There's got to be something beyond. Uh, private investment in interests of larger economic objectives and goals becomes a major opportunity. And last but not least, there is something that the government is doing right. Over nearly 20 years, there's been over $7 billion invested in commercial companies, most of it by NASA. And all of it has generated this churn, this interest, this capability that's driven investment into a startup space company. There are opportunities. There are opportunities. And I'd like to thank the, uh, the um, IDA Science and Technology Policy Institute, or STIPI, for introducing a model that talks a little bit about products versus demand. So, so we've been talking about government demand. Uh, there is a government demand for science. There's a government demand for uh, further exploration. There's a government demand for um, education, developing STEM. All of these things justify an investment, and we've talked about some of the things that we can buy or we will need to buy, whether it's lunar landers or launches or the infrastructure, where we're talking about power and communications, uh, phenomenology, various things that will make us smarter. Um, we talk about uh, test data. Um, we talk about mining. All, all of those things are in response to a government demand for science, for exploration, for knowledge of um, uh, the overall space um, area around uh, the moon looking towards 
uh, deep space and towards Earth. But of course, there's more. If we're really interested in generating a demand, there are some things that are opportunities for general consumers. We talked about tourism, right? So what's, what, <laughs> I honestly don't think that there are gonna be a lot of folks that can afford to take missions to the lunar surface or even lunar orbit. But I think that there's more. That there is an opportunity, I believe, for entertainment. Entertainment is a huge driver of interest. So if you can imagine virtual reality or augmented reality or glasses or a field of drones that are covering the surface of the moon or even fights at the lunar surface, I mean, there, there is an opportunity for engagement and involvement at the lunar surface that will uh, appeal to and engage the general population. And all of those things will require even more than what the government demands are driving. So there will have to be landers, there will be a hotel, there will be, there will be things that are on the surface and there will have to be an infrastructure. And what I really like about the model is that if there's an interest in driving dollars from overall consumers, there's going to be a competition on cost and quantity. Right, so, so knowing that you've got to reach more people will change the conversation about what's it take and how's it, it uh, going to occur. And my last column is uh, something that's a, a little different, which is a competition for other government dollars. There will be products that could be generated on the lunar surface that could change how we approach and resolve social issues. And so I listed just, just a few. Um, there have been some conversations around climate change solutions, for example. If you can imagine that not only are you looking into deep space with observatories, but with an opportunity to observe the Earth and the sun, there may be some information and data that you would get about space weather that could change an understanding and perhaps provide solutions associated with uh, climate change. Or there are solutions associated with green technologies for propellant systems that could be applicable to the kinds of challenges that we have on, on Earth. Uh, one example uh, recently uh, hit the news, um, and it's been in the news off and on, uh, SpaceX's Starhopper. So that's a, a design that was based on technology that the uh, AFRL, the Air Force Research Laboratories, developed for launching a rocket and, have it, and having it land. Uh, they passed that technology on and now that that's been carried forward by the uh, SpaceX team. But what's amazing about that technology is that it could revolutionize how we get products and, and um, perhaps travel on Earth. You would be able to go most anywhere on the planet within an hour, for example. So imagine what that would do to supply chain economics. Um, coming from the South, one of the challenges that we always have are hurricanes and inclement weather. If you could imagine a solution that would potentially provide kits or capabilities to folks that have lost all power, that have lost water, that have lost all communications with some of the solutions that are gonna be developed for lunar habitats. And my favorite is a doctor in a box. Maybe not within the next four to six years, maybe we won't see a Medicare for all plan, but I do believe that that's coming. I think it has the potential to bankrupt a number of elements of the community. But I also know that if there is going to be a sustained presence on the moon or Mars, there will have to be a capability for almost immediate diagnosis of an illness and treatment. Imagine if that capability were in the hands of everyone. And it was done at a scale such that it was cost effective. There, there is a potential market space I believe, for all of those things as we reshape the expectations of the moon. NASA has developed a small nuclear reactor. They call it kilopower because it is small. It's being developed for lunar operations. On the dark side of the moon, you need to have some capability. Um, it gets extremely cold. So they're looking at nuclear power. How would that revolutionize power challenges on Earth, and oh, by the way, what if there were something that could only be done on the moon? A lunar test bed, for example, for nuclear applications. So there are products, right? Oh yeah, right, right. So it's not products, it's a demand. 
So who's asking the questions? And I think that truly is the issue. How do we incentivize demand? And I've got four solutions I'd like to share with you. Uh, Public-private partnerships, government procured services, international partnerships, and new power. <clears throat> Public-private partnerships and government procured services. So, so we've seen a lot of progress in this area. Reducing costs through commercial innovation is something that we've not only demonstrated in space with programs like the International Space Station, but we also have a great precedent on Earth. Right, where, where there is an investment in technology that we're able to share with commercial enterprises and find ways for them to not necessarily innovate the technology so much, but innovate on cost, find ways to do things quicker and faster and cheaper. Uh, require, requiring private cost share. This has been something that's been implemented in a number of the lunar contracts that have been let so far. There is a requirement that the companies provide 20%, at least 20% of their own funding in order to be considered for a contract win. So as you consider those J curves, obviously pulling a curve up by 20% is beneficial and it creates a level of commitment from the companies that are engaged. Um, also think it needs to be a little bit more dialogue about some of the other tools that have been successfully implemented in terrestrial um, market development. So for example, uh, having an investment such as your reduced technology risk, we talk a lot about that. But in developing a capability for railroad systems, developing a capability for aircraft systems, there was an investment in generating the markets. So whether it was land leases or grants or finding ways to pay more for an initial product in order to develop a capability, all those were proven effective. Imagine if you're putting together a business case in your small company and there is a document that you have from the government to say, we're going to be buying 10 million pounds of oxygen and we were going to pay this so much per pound. You start to have the ability to develop a business case. And last but not least, probably the one unexpected recommendation I'd make is to assess commoditization. How many people here have had the opportunity to see the SpaceX production facility in Hawthorne? So I saw it a number of years ago, and knowing how fast things move, I'm sure it's very different today, but one of the things that I saw when I walked into the building was a production line in a space factory that I had never seen before. One of the very first things that we were told that was that, were that they were making 100 Merlin engines that year. The number 100 is a huge number in the space business. And meant that they had to be efficient, they had to be effective, they had to find a way to test, and they needed to keep a production line running and going because they had a commodity. They had something that they were building that was consistent. So you see the picture there, and it represents a lot of the folks that received commercial uh, lunar landing contracts where they're competing a design. A lot of them are Google X Prize uh, participants, and I love the Google X Prize because it allows you to develop innovative solutions. But someplace in my gut, I think you landed on the moon before. I know, I know that there's a technology, there's a cape, we've landed on Mars before. If you can imagine a real commitment to buying services, wouldn't it feel a little bit like buying the services that you use today? So if you're going to move products, if you're going to move your furniture, do you really expect the moving company to design their own truck every time they move your products? So, so if there were technologies, capabilities, and knowledge that could be handed off, imagine what we would be innovating on. I can only think that that would make things faster and cheaper and then allow for us to move forward. International partnerships, I've, I've got to hand it to NASA. They, they have done a fantastic job in pushing for international partnerships through time. Uh, there's an, if you look at global, globally, there's like $80 billion that are being spent by governments on space. And, and much of it, of course, is to develop a sovereign capability and to develop national pride. And a lot of countries use 
space as a means to drive STEM, but almost all of them talk about it as an economic engine driver. So, so there is a ton of interest in partnerships and capability. Uh, from personal experience, I had the opportunity to work on the uh, shuttle program way back in the day, um, working on the external tank after the Columbia accident. And as you'll recall, the program, special program was shut down for a couple of years as we were trying to get to a point where we were uh, developing solutions for uh, safe and effective return to flight. During that window of time, there were lots of things that were going on in the background, including two or three cancellations of the program entirely. And I remember once getting a letter from um, ESA saying that because of the commitment to you guys that are in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, we're going to continue to maintain funding for our program so that we can continue to build the International Space Station and we will push on our side to make sure your country stays engaged. I think that there's something to be said for ways to tie the strings together beyond administration. So international partnerships are extremely critical. Um, international Space Station has 60 modules. Seven of them are built by countries other than the United States. I think that story tells us a lot, as well as the fact that we have maintained American astronauts in space, even though we haven't had a shuttle program for years. New power. Who's familiar with the term new power? All right. So, so new power was introduced a few years ago by Jeremy Hymans and Henry Timms in a book named New Power. And um, probably a concept is best explained by an example. Uh, 2014 was a year which included early summer. A number of firemen in Kentucky who were trying to raise money for a friend who had cancer um, came up with an idea of uh, dousing people with water and having them commit to a pledge to donate so much money. Uh, I think it was $10. It's $10. Um, and you take the uh, water dousing, or, and then you name three more people. And so you continue to pay it forward. If you decide not to get doused, you pay $100. Um, and they made a video of it, and they put it online. Um, it eventually got picked up by a number of golfers who, uh, instead of having a water hose, had an ice bucket, because that's what they had in their golf carts, and they would dump ice buckets on their head, and one of the key golfers uh, decided to make it um, a charity in support of ALS, an ALS investment. Long story short, over a period of a summer, um, there were thousands of ALS ice bucket challenges. Um, they raised uh, say $150 million, four times their, in that summer, four times their typical annual budget. There were 10 billion views of these videos online. And it came about because of participation, engagement, watching the videos, and wanting to belong to something bigger. I think many of us have seen the impact of this through the hashtag MeToo movement, hashtag Black Lives Matter, Occupy movement. I, I remember I was in um, New, New Orleans walking down the street after dinner when I saw kids running down the street, and these are like high school kids, just running down the street with their phones looking for a meetup point as they were getting ready to tear down their statue of Robert E. Lee. They, they were organizing real time and showed up in hundreds of folks because of something that they picked up on their phone, some level of engagement. So, so that there, there is something to be said for the fact that things are changing. The, the way that Hyman's explains it is that Old power is the equivalent of currency. It's something that people work very hard to gain and collect and manage through an organization and a structure. And once you have a structure, it's managed by leadership and organization. Whereas new power is currency. That's something that flows, that you pass as quickly as you can. You engage as many people as you can in order to uh, 
make a difference. Probably beyond those one-off events, we see it in things like open source code, where when lots of people can participate in developing apps, for example, you start to see something that's much, much larger than a single company you could build or write because lots of people are opting in and want to participate. And that is the key. It is participation. New power is about participation. Old power is about consuming and sharing and developing a series of boundaries and developing ways to maintain and gain dollars and benefit. Uh, whereas the participation scale says that everybody plays. Everybody owns it. Everybody can find a way to innovate. You find ways to give information and data out and let other people design, repurpose, and share. Of course, <laughs> there's some risks. Once you share information and designs and technology and data, you lose control. So, so one of the risks of that you get a whole bunch of stuff that you didn't know or want. And secondly, it, it can't be a, a once and done activity. It can't be a flash and plan. The ALS story um, probably has a couple of, of sides uh, to it. Um, I don't know how many of you remember the Jerry Lewis telethon, right? So it used to come on on Labor Day. It was a huge money raising activity. Um, it doesn't exist anymore because they said that the means for collecting and getting people to contribute had evolved over time. People were more comfortable with doing things online and through other tools and means. Um, evidence of, of, of guess, new power methods and ways, and I'm sure you've heard about the decline of shopping malls and stores because people find it easier just to shop from home. I think it's magic, right? I'm considering, I have no telling what I bought uh, until it shows up sometimes. Um, but the ELS story is one that I find that's of interest and really points to the point of it being critical to maintain focus and engagement. Um, after quadrupling their yearly income in one summer, ELS decided that they were done with standard um, ways to bring in sponsorships and uh, contributions. Uh, the following summer, rather than it being um, 100 and some million dollars, it brought in $500,000. So, so there, there was something about the excitement and engagement that petered out over time, and that has to be a challenge that's met as we look forward to uh, how to engage um, with participation. But I think there's something that's magic there. And if we are going to make this program, the Lunar Sustained, Sustained Lunar Program, it's got to be something that does speak to all of us and each of us. Um, there's a comedian. Her name's Wanda Sykes, and she has a bit on space. In her space bit, she says that NASA is a welfare program for really smart people. She says there are people that are so smart they don't understand the relevance of what they do and you can't stand to listen to them. So you make them go stand outside and look up. That's not what I want the space program to be about. It's our program. There are ways to make this an Earth first campaign to think about the kinds of things that impact us. Um, the UAE, United Arab Emirates, has their own program. Um, in order to uh, celebrate the forming of their country, they are sending a mission to Mars. If you look at their information page, the story they tell about their plans for space includes an expectation of 3D printed artificial limbs that would cost about 100 US dollars. By 2025, I think that's their goal. That, that's their space program, in addition to the Mars mission. It, it includes things like that that make it relevant to everybody every day, where the benefits of the program are obvious and have something that grabs and talks to each and every person. And I know that we talk about technology transfer, and that's a huge benefit. But to me, it always feels like someone is doing patent searches or patent trolling, as we used to call it, or looking back in the past to find a technology or capability that could be used, it needs to be more relevant. Using a capability that is often used in order to drive capability 
in certain countries, where you've got what they call twin labs, where you've got a group that's got a capability and a group that's trying to develop a capability, looking at the same requirements and building up a set of competence and capability. I could certainly foresee twin labs on the moon and on Earth where joint requirements for habitats, for example, that are cheap and plentiful and could address perhaps some of our um, homeless crises are, are developed and used. The stories matter. We can change this and we can own it. So, are you in? There are five flags on the moon. Five flags standing today on the moon. They're seen, at least the shadows are seen, by the lunar reconnaissance orbiter. They represent a capability that all of us have. And I've got to say, I can't wait until the day when there are habitats, when there is a casino, there is, there's a hotel, and there are things there that will change what we do on Earth because I think we owe it to ourselves. But it'll change the, di have to, the dialogue that we're having has to change. The engagement has to change and it'll involve all of us. So, are you in? Thank you.